I came to Travello in 2018 because I was going to give up because I remember doing Shepparton in November 2018 and going back to work the next day and people said, how did you go? And I said, oh, the girls are all so fast. <laughs> and I was just like, in my head, I'm like, why are they so fast? Why am I going backward? And I was like, oh, I'm just going to give this up. I'm just going to do park run and swim. I'm not going to do this anymore. And on my wall, <laughs> I had... Um, I wanted to run the 100Ks in the Blue Mountains and I looked at that and I went, if I don't do that, I'll regret it for the rest of my life. This podcast is brought to you by Trivelo Coaching, where we help triathletes and cyclists like you train smarter to race faster. I'm your host, Jordan Donnelly, and on my left is former Australian Ironman champion and head coach of Trivelo Coaching, Jared Donnelly. 41 hours, 50 minutes, and seven seconds. That's how long it took Rachel to complete the notorious Ultra Trail de Mont Blanc, a 160 kilometer endurance race that finishes with over 10,000 meters of climbing, runs across three countries, and has to be one of the hardest races in the world. And the fact that 2,600 people started the race and 900 people did not finish shows what kind of torture it is. So today we have Rachel on the podcast to take us through what she described as something that she will never put herself through again. And we'll see if that's true later, but you won't believe the effort it took to go through this experience from the entire training preparation to the actual race. Today, we're talking about some of Rachel's insane training sessions, including 12 hour overnight forest runs. How can you possibly prepare yourself for a 41 hour race? How she managed the ridiculous volume of training while working a job from eight to six each day or longer and how can the body exercise for 41 hours without sleeping and the ruthless every man or woman for themselves mentality of the race and of course so much more so we cannot wait for you to hear this one it's just a remarkable story and of course this episode is brought to you by our proud sponsor giant australia for all your bike training and racing needs ride life ride giant rachel a very warm welcome to the podcast thanks for joining us thanks for having me the first question I want to ask is, can you take us back to the moment that you decided this is the event you're going to enter? Uh, so Ultra Trail Kosciuszko was a new event in Australia last December and I wanted to try 100 miles. See, I've only ever done 100 kilometre runs. So I thought, let's see what 100 miles, Lisa. You know, it's only another <laughs> 70 kilometres. <laughs> uh, so it's a little bit of a jump and you know, I really wanted to go and run in Um, up at Kosciuszko. So in December it was snowing, it's summer. Uh, (laughs) And, but they had said with Kosciuszko, it gave you a chance to uh, get running stones, which are like little lottery tickets for Ultra Trail Mont Blanc. So I thought if I ever have a chance, this is going to be my chance. And you apply and I applied in January, they said you're going. So it's, it told me. That's, that's great. (laughs) Were you Always thinking about this back when you did, uh, say, the Blue Mountains Classic a couple of years ago, the Surf Coast Classic, all those of long endurance events. Were you always thinking about Mont Blanc? I'd heard about Mont Blanc when I first uh, started doing Ironman triathlon. I remember people telling me that there was a run where you had to take your passport because you've got to run <laughs> France into Swiss, uh, into Italy, into Switzerland. I went, wow, that's crazy. You know, how long does this take people? And I remember them saying, you know, days. <laughs> so I'd heard about it. And then, you know, of course, you never think it's going to happen to you. It was probably like you know, the dream event, a bit like Kona Ironman. And coach, do you remember that conversation, that <laughs> initial conversation of <laughs> can I enter this event? Well, some of the conversations that Rachel and I have had over the years have been, oh, really? That's what you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> so she shocks me the whole time with her next adventure. I call them adventures because the listener needs to understand Rachel has done marathons. She's done ultra running. She's done Ironman triathlon. There isn't anything she hasn't had to go at. And stair running up the Rialto and overseas. Did you did you do some stair running overseas as well? No, I've no. done Ironman in Estonia, in Europe, yep. but, uh, and some runs. I've done the Great Wall of China. I guess that's a stair run. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so true. No, the Great Wall of China marathon was, yeah, a lot of stairs. So I, I class Rachel as our endurance beast, <laughs> and um, there isn't a challenge that she's not up for. I think that's uh, the easy thing for me is what, what are we doing next? And already today, because she's still recovering from this event, mm-hmm. our questions are already around, well, what's next? Mm-hmm. So how many marathons have you done overall, do you think? Oh, I've done 16 iron marathons and then uh, I think I've done 10 straight marathons. But then obviously there's ultras as yeah, well. for sure. How many ultras 
Oh, yeah, a few. <laughs> I just uh, step back one when you asked the question uh, about talking to your dad, Len. Uh, I first came to Trivello because I wanted to do my first 100Ks. Yep. And yep. I'd said to your dad, you know, oh, you know, have you tried to coach someone for 100Ks? Yeah, 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 I've coached people for 100Ks. <laughs> but then I could come to him and say, have you coached someone for 100 miles? <laughs> so no, no, I haven't. <laughs> so we've done it together. And now I have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's some learnings that we'll talk about. So I really want to hone in on the, on the motivation for it. So they, you qualified for it. But you still have to accept and say yes. So what was the motivation behind that? I was pretty quick at accepting because I knew it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah. I don't think you know, these chances come along. People try for years to get a spot. So, And I just knew that I got this spot to do this event. I wasn't going to pass it up. Tell us the difference between the endurance stuff you've done. What's the hardest thing you've done now that you've got all these events behind you? Does this rank as the number one thing you've ever done? I did the Hawaiian Ironman with a broken bone through my foot. Um, so that doing that marathon in the Hawaiian Ironman was pretty tough. Um, but that was such a short event now <laughs> compared mm. to doing an event that was over 40, well, it was 41, 42 hours, but you're up all day as well. So it's that I've never done anything that long. So yeah, they're probably the same, so to speak. Like Hawaii was so painful because I was trying to run on a broken foot mm. um, and the bone was broken right through. But I think this is pretty much up there. So, yeah, I, I want to go back to your dad and go, you've accepted that this is the next adventure um, and what goes through your head about, okay, what, what's the preparation required? What, is, what does this look like from now until the race? Well, the beauty of having Rachel, having done all this stuff before, it's not like someone out of the blue saying, I'm going to run 170K or 165K, whatever, 100 miles equals. And I don't oh. Oh, was a, it up. was 179 Ks when you added my watch up. So, you know, the <laughs> trail running is never spot on. That's it's right. <laughs> and for anyone that's heard many of our marathon stories about people trying to make break a barrier, you know, the, the marathon's 42.2, but often they're finishing at 42.8 or 43.4 or something because it's just the nature of the course. You run the extra distance and that is exaggerated over a 160 kilometer race. You've, you've run an extra 19 <laughs> kilometers, which is just not. What's, what's, what's a few more Ks, right? Rachel, wasn't there a blue line you could follow? <laughs> You ran the an extra shortest half route. The shortest route. Oh. Did you get lost somewhere to run an extra I, I thought, night? I, I did think that. I thought maybe I was sleepwalking and I did go in a little. <laughs> so really, it's not as daunting because of what we've done together before. So she has such a background already in, you know, several hundred K events. And, and she knows that there's going to be six hours, eight hours, 10 hours. Probably she didn't know there's going to be 12 hour run. But she knows that that progress is coming because that's what you have to do. To, to prepare your body. And, and for the 100K, it's a 15-hour event. So we're doing 10 hours or eight-hour training sessions for a 15-hour event. As a coach, I'm asking myself, well, it's 40 hours. What, how do we train for that? Yeah. And, and there, you, can't, you can't do a 30K, 30-hour training session. Yeah. So it's accumulation of weeks of just keeping on adding some endurance to program and hopefully she doesn't break down from that. And, you know, you've got to understand that this is the middle of winter for an event in August. And so all of her training was done in the freezing cold and possibly rain. And it always hail. in the dark. In the dark. <laughs> and that, that is one of the, the most bewildering things that I think people don't understand about this preparation and your dedication was turning up to the Dandenong forests here in Victoria and you'd start at night because you wanted to practice running overnight and you do these 12 hour runs through the night in the middle of winter. If you've ever been up here in winter, it is freezing and it's not as cold as I guess North, some North American winters, but you've literally trail around 12 hours through the night. Can you talk us through some of those training sessions? I think the training like for all events is harder than the event sometimes um, because you're on your own and there's a lot of wildlife at night <laughs> in the day. <laughs> So I've learned, you know, deer make some sounds in the night and wallabies, which are small kangaroos, jump in front of you in the night. So, but at least I, I was really prepared and I knew, you know, when my head torch goes out, it goes out, it's black. But we were very lucky uh, in Ultra Trail Mont Blanc that it was the super moon weekend. Oh. So thank God for the moon. Yeah. But everyone, the first night is just headlights. The, all mm. up the mountain and I looked and I looked behind me and there was all headlights behind me. The second night, not so many, but the second night I was like, oh, I've still got some people. It's not as bad as the Dandyongs. There's no wildlife running around. Yeah. All you hear is cowbells. 
So it wasn't, you know, that that wasn't too bad. And your thoughts watching these training sessions is it's some of the most extreme training that, that no, I just feel cruel. Like I'm setting it and I feel bad. Right. Imagine how Rachel feels doing the session. It's hard to explain how much admiration I have for someone who can go out by themselves in the middle of the night and have no fear. And mm. she's she's got fear about it, but she's overcoming it because she's so determined. Personality is one of unbelievable determination. And I don't know how many people who would go and do that after being set that program would look at the coach and go, are you for real? Are you, do you really expect me to do that? But Rachel never has that answer for me. It's always, okay, how long am I going for? And off she goes. And it's quite remarkable coaching someone like that. It's a dream to coach someone like that because they're so on board and they trust the process. And I think because we've been working successfully together, and I'm sure if we had had some dodgy events where things didn't go so well, you'd be questioning a bit more. But you tell me how, how it's gone over the period. I came to Travello in 2018 because I was going to give up because I remember doing Shepparton in November 2018 and going back to work the next day and people said, how did you go? And I said, oh, the girls are all so fast. <laughs> and I was just like, in my head, I'm like, why are they so fast? Why am I going backward? And I was like, oh, I'm just going to give this up. I'm just going to do park run and swim. I'm not going to do this anymore. And on my wall, <laughs> I had... Um, I wanted to run the 100Ks in the Blue Mountains and I looked at that and I went, if I don't do that, I'll regret it for the rest of my life. And I was like, i got to get a coach that's going to help me and um, did a bit of investigation and I thought, I'll go to Trivello, do the 100Ks and then I'm done. (laughs) That's hilarious. And um, I did the 100Ks and it was the best run. I, we said 15 hours was my goal. We did 15 hours. <laughs> that, that is remarkable. I think it was a few seconds over, wasn't it? Yeah, it was it? a few seconds over, but I'm not one, I'm not, not, we don't, you know, I'm not one that's not that OCD. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was in shock that we had the time almost exact. Like To me, that was like, are you kidding? You've done exactly the time that we predicted. So take us through the training program. How do you, how do you train properly? The, obviously, the endurance session on the weekend is, is the most important, but what do you yep doing through the week and yeah, so I um, I have a job that's 6 to 6, uh, so 6 a.m. to oh. 6 p.m. is the minimum, so I do do long hours, so thank goodness I've got a coach that understands that you've got to work. My apologies in the intro, <laughs> I cut you short two hours, I gave you 8 that's to okay. 6, but <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense, yes. All good, all good. Uh, so we would uh, run some of the way to work, uh, so, or uh, you're like, do double sessions, so sometimes I'd catch the train halfway home and run the rest of the way home. Um, so it was good because I had to get to work and get home. So it was just part of the process. Quite often I ride my bike. Um, instead, I'd just run. Uh, so it just meant, you know, getting up a little bit earlier. Instead of 4 a.m., sometimes it was 3 a.m. But, you know, I knew they were the, the days that would make the difference in the event um, when I was, you know, doing the event because I was uh, knew I was going to be tired, but no tighter than when I'm working in training. Mm. And some of the th- – you know, the sessions that Rachel was doing, she might uh, ride her bike to work on Tuesday morning and it would be an hour and we wouldn't try not to do anything too hard, just get her to work. And then she would have to run home, which would be, if you went the long way, it could be an hour and a half. If she went the short way, it could be whatever. So I would give her 45 minutes and she would get off the train according to the time yeah. that was left. And so the next morning she would run back to work and then that night she would ride back home. So so we were using her commute um, as, a, as her program because there was no more time. Mm. You don't, there's no more time in the day that she had available when it's a race of such volume you're not worried about a traditional program of vo2 max sessions and you're really just trying to get your body used to that volume and you've got to allow yourself the time we talk about this all the time but you've got to allow in rachel's case years of build up of preparation to be able to cope this training load and cope race day that was the key to it rachel had such a good uh endurance base um, from all the work she'd done from when we very first first started 2018 or 19, um, we, we really worked on her um, ability to cope with load and that's what she got good at. And you had a, quite a few injuries over your career. Before, before I, came, before yep. I became, came to Trivello, yep. And, <laughs> and that, that was one of your major concerns was, I don't want to be injured, I want to, I want to keep training, I'm sick of being doing some training and then getting injured. So getting you fit for not intensity, but getting you fit for strength. And so we did a lot of hill, hill runs and hill repeats. And, and funnily enough, uh, anytime I tried to give Rachel any intensity in training, she, she couldn't match the intensity that we would give her. And then come race day, she would smash it. It's quite a conundrum to be as a coach. I'm saying, Rachel, what's going on with the training session? You're not hitting the targets. And then race day, I'd hit a, I'd give her a, a target pace 
for a 10K or a half marathon and she would smash what I gave her. And it was quite incredible how competitive she is and then how uncompetitive she is when she's training by herself. <laughs> that, that can definitely happen. And as a side note, I think it is worth mentioning that this is a um, great almost anecdotal social experiment or training experiment for um, for zone two training and um, just long, consistent K's in the legs because Rachel over the years has consistently ran PBs at the shorter distance, 5K, 10K, even half marathon, which is definitely short to her, but not everyone else, um, without doing any intensity, all just from build, building that endurance base, which I think a lot of people could learn a lot from. But also, as I was talking to Rachel off air, um, don't underestimate how much the intensity we got from swimming and on the bike. Mm-hmm. And so we weren't trying to run with intensity, which stopped her getting injured. Mm-hmm. That was going to be a problem. If we started giving her 400s on a track, she's going to break down. Yep. So the intensity had to come from, you know, as I said to her, your heart and lungs don't know whether you're running, riding or swimming. They just know that it's puffing. It's yep. breathing hard. Yep. And if you do that on the sports that have no load from gravity, swimming and riding, then you can do all the hard, hard sessions you like in those sports and it really builds your cardiovascular system. And as long as you keep running and uh, and your load for your legs, your muscular sy- system and your skeletal system, that's going to withstand anything, you know, because your cardio can cope with it. So there's some lonely cold, dark mornings and nights. And, yes. and sure, geez, sometimes if you had a long work day, the last thing you want to do is rug yourself up and try and run home. Were there many tough periods um, throughout throughout winter and in those in that tra- those training blocks? I had one run out at Mount Donabuang, so that's an eighteen k climb for people that aren't familiar. A lot of cyclists do it, and it was pouring with rain, and it was so wet that it was like a, a river coming down the road because I was running up the road because it was so dark. I wasn't going up the track and so wet, and I didn't want to you know fall over and break an ankle or anything. So I was running up the road. It was pitch black, pouring with rain. I had water proof socks and in half an hour those waterproof socks weren't waterproof (laughs) my leggings were falling down my legs because they were so wet and this was just running up the hill (laughs) and it's you know a good two hours to run up the hill uh so yeah that was probably one of the toughest days and when we got to the top it was nearly snowing like I was just up there on my own and it was like so cloudy and I had my gloves I knew and it was just so cold and I went I gotta run back down gotta (laughs) run back down and I just ran the like as hard as I could back down to try and just keep warm. So yeah, that was a really tough day out there. Yeah, that was probably one of the. And there was, you know, it was. It's lonely, but you've got the big goal, mm. uh, and I think you just got to push through that loneliness and just go. Yep, I've got to. I just got to get this done. And you remember those really tough sessions when it's tough during the event. Well, that was my next question. Is Did you ever feel like giving up or that it wasn't worth it? No, I don't give up. That's just not in me. And that's why, you know, I came to Trivello because, you know, I wasn't giving up. And I've seen that so many times, like trying to get a spot for Kona, trying to get a spot for Kona. And I missed out one year by three minutes or something crazy, you know, like it was just like, do I just give up? I'm like, I'm not giving up. You know, like I saw so many people give up. Like I'm not giving up on my dreams. There's no regrets here. Perseverance is one of the things that Rachel is king of. (laughs) And, you know, it takes a a real mindset to do the training by yourself in uncomfortable conditions. It takes a real certain personality to be able to do that. And just give us an insight, Rachel. What are you thinking when you're at work knowing that tonight I've got to run? It's bucketing down it's freezing it's july in the middle of melbourne winter what's your mindset are you how are you going about that is it i'm just doing it or yeah i'm just doing it i just make sure you know try and have the right gear and it was good because i had always had my backpack so it was good training to run with the you know a backpack because in the event you had to carry my backpack weighed about six kilos with um obviously with two liters of fluid as well uh so that was just it was just all training and i didn't know what weather i was going to get i'm day. going to the highest point in europe mm. it's probably going to s- snow you know i mm. didn't so i think i didn't have i never had a time where i was like i'm not doing a session my my training peaks is green we've spoken a lot about that on this <laughs> podcast but the best athletes it's you know you set the sessions in training peaks and if you do the session it goes green and if you do it and do too much too less it's a traffic light system so it's either yellow or orange if you don't do it it's red and Rachel would be one of those athletes that is just that perfect green consistency <laughs> that, but that's just me and I'm like I, I'm not going to let myself down so I don't want to let the coach down mm. 
Mm. Like that's just me. I really want to make sure in this episode, we're not skimming over just some of these casual statements like that 18 kilometer climb. You know, you, when you go f- for an endurance hilly run, you, you might hit a, a two or four minute hill, you know, in the Dandenongs, even a 10 minute climb, but you, a two hour climb, a two hour 18 kilometer <laughs> climb that you you mentioned is a, is a cycling climb, but, but you've yeah. run on it. Uh, but Rachel's also done Donna Buang running climbs, which is, you know, for a cyclist, that's an hour to climb up Donna Buang. How long did it take you to go up there? Yeah, two hours. Yeah, yeah that's two hours. Yeah, yep. two. And I, I do want to dive into this mindset. I know that uh, giving up is not in your nature, but did you ever question whether the goal was worth it? Or I know that you you say to yourself, that's what I want to do, but we are just going, it's it's not even worth this much. No, because I knew Europe's going to be so <laughs> hilly. Like, <laughs> and now that I've been there, there's no hills in Melbourne. You know, we all know <laughs> that when we go over there and cycle with the Tour mm. de France, like we don't have hills here. But I really, I knew that it was going to be hilly, but it was really hilly over there, like a whole nother level. So yeah. even knowing I had run up Mount Donabuang and I did as every hill I could find in the Dandenongs and I was r- running mm. Perrins Creek Road, which is another cyclist. So I was trying to do all the cycling ones, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, in the dark because I was like, I need to find the steepest, hardest hills I could. It still wasn't enough. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so. that, that, that is the most rewarding part. Um, I keep asking you these kind of motivational questions and you just, you just kind of, your mindset is so strong. It doesn't even it doesn't even hit you on the like come into your radar that you could possibly give up. But I want to keep going. Did your motivation ever wane, or were you just ever any sessions where you just going? I really don't want to do today. No, oh, I think there was once I sent a text message when I got the twelve hour training session. I just said. Oh. <laughs> Is this the last one? <laughs> I think I am. I sort of I was just preparing myself because I was like I had you know on the weekend we have social events and I had a big friend a, a friend's birthday was zero so I went to the dinner you know and I said oh, I've just got to you know, go <laughs> <laughs> and drive up to the dining. I was like no one knew and then I you know, did my twelve hour run and then I had my goddaughter's birthday lunch on Sunday so I went straight to Mornington for the oh next birthday goodness. and I was like everyone's like oh you know what are you doing and I'm like oh nothing just a little run. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't slept yet. <laughs> I didn't tell anybody anything. I was just trying to fit it all in. Yep. But everyone's going to try and fit their training in. But, I, you know, it's, to me, it's just like what I do. Yeah. Yep. You're, you're probably better off not telling anybody what you just did. because no, they people would, don't understand no. unless they're a, you know, an athlete. They and, think you're crazy. Yeah, they would have locked me up. <laughs> and to your credit also, I don't think you specifically set the 12-hour sessions or the 10 hours overnight. You just wanted to do them, but it was you took it on yourself, I, right? Yeah, I yeah. wanted to do it at uh, night. Also, I needed to make sure my head torch, how many hours I could get out of my head torch, yeah, yeah. Uh, my nutrition and being out on your own. And yeah, you, it was all all training for the event. So there's so many things to this event that you don't think about, like the head torch running out, batteries, what are you carrying in your pack, the extra six kilos, which is just running 41 hours is hard enough. If if you've ever run 10K, half marathon, marathon, you know that half an extra kilo will kill you, but (laughs) to have to run with a pack, (laughs) six kilos. kilos. Uh, One really interesting one was the um, Garmin conundrum where you actually have to take two Garmins, two Garmin watches, because they run flat after 41 hours. They actually can't make the whole race, which to me is just astounding. So any other little things you did in practice uh, in training for these sessions that um, you probably wouldn't have found out unless you did like a 10 or 12 hour run? Uh, well, the nutrition was knack and we don't have knack in Australia. So I had to get it sent over from Canada and, you know, just trying to make the, have the bars and the, the drink. Um, I'm glad I did that because I knew I wasn't going to drink that drink unless I really had to. Mm-hmm. Um, and I hope, you know, no one from knack is listening. <laughs> 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 They're never sponsoring me. So it's okay. Um, but yeah. Um, they could do something with the taste. Is that what you're saying? That's a kind way. Uh, I do, I'm not a watermelon person. It was watermelon flavor, so maybe it's just me. <laughs> but I, I was like, if I had to have it, I was prepared, but I didn't have it. <laughs> One of the things that Rachel is unbelievable at is preparation. And we say, you know, it's great. Here's a training program, but the training program is not just the exercise part of it. It's actually understanding the requirements of the race. And she just went to the nth degree to find every single thing that she needed to do in preparation. So her preparation is is almost better than her execution of what she does on the day. Her execution is always great. Mm. Um, she really understands right from the start the theory of even pacing and you'll get the best result, uh, whether it's 42 hours or <laughs> four hours yeah. or four minutes. Yeah. She understood that right from the beginning, and but un- also understanding that w- what is required for this event, and she's done so many variations in events like the surf coast is on the sand on the beach, it's climbing boulders with your hands and knees, and then got some trail runs. It's got varied terrain. Well, she knew all that, mm. and 
found out about it and mm. and was prepared for that. And Kosciuszko had snow ice. You can't really prepare for that that well. And she did fall over and, and really hurt herself. And her mindset was she was really injured and she kept going. I think mm. it was 20K mm-hmm. out of 160. She was injured for 140K. So that gives the listener an example of – strength of mind yeah. and some people might say well that's ridiculous if you're injured why would you keep going but but that's the way Rachel is and she gets she gets over the injury and she's ready and that got her to qualify for exactly. this event yeah without that she, yeah, that was her mindset is yeah. oh, if, I'm, if I don't finish I'm not going to qualify yeah. so my dream is not going to happen so what was what, what happened in the injury what happened when you- oh they have what's called the cheese grater so it's like a metal pathway it's more for obviously during the snow and that the whole race they had said we weren't to we weren't going to run this five section five k section because it is so dangerous. But then because the weather had turned so bad, they changed the race and said, "Oh, you can run." So everyone's running on this cheese grater, but I don't think trail shoes and cheese grater go together. <laughs> I went down pretty hard, and my knees, both knees, but one knee more than the other, was just so swollen. Mm. And then to, it got to the point where I just couldn't run because it was so sore. But yeah. I think I learned from that event, you just keep moving. And I've got through Hawaii Ironman with the broken foot. So, <laughs> yeah, again, you just got to keep keep moving, you know. Like, and people listening are probably going, oh, this girl's crazy. <laughs> Better lock her up. But I think it's just I don't, I don't want to be that person that didn't finish and, you know, it doesn't give it at all. That's just not me. So how long was that? Was the Kosciuszko race? No, that was 30. So that was 100 mile and yeah. that was – about 30 hours. 30 hours. Yeah, yeah, with a bit of walking, obviously. But believe me, that course was flat after what I've just done. <laughs> yeah, the, dif- the difference for a similar distance, mm. uh, difference in time is yeah. nearly 12 hours. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it shows you that- And I wasn't uh, injured in <laughs> no, my that's right. You, you were quite healthy. And the elevation <laughs> is what kills everybody because it's 10,000 metres of climbing mm. in, in one race. Mm. It's the 11 Ks downhill. <laughs> yeah. 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 And we'll touch on that when we get to the race. But again, we you just say these casual statements like it's it's an extra 12 hours but it's it's the same distance and it's an extra 12 hours that just shows the difference in elevation ascending and descending so let's start to talk about the race prep and and get into the race and um some of your last conversations here between athlete and coach and i know you came up here and, and spoke to that in person and talk us through that conversation when you're starting to really the race is coming up and you're really it's in front of you it's becoming real now so what's happening there of course i got really nervous and you yeah. know it came like all you think you've got lots of time and and then all of a sudden it's there and yeah. you're like, oh, God, have I done enough? Have I done enough? And we had no idea how long it was going to take. We The um, event gives you 46 and a half hours. So I always said it's like, like 46, the half an hour buffer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so 46 or, or less, you know, I, I had no idea. I thought, you know, it would probably be some 36 hours we were talking about. Um, and then I laughed when I was out there. I'm like, it's not going to be 36 hours. <laughs> it's going to have a four in front of it. <laughs> and I'm like, and then I got to the point where it's like, oh, my God even finish you know like it's the clock is ticking and it's mm. really tough so yeah I, I think your dad you know he, he was it was the unknown for us and mm, but absolutely. that's that's why it was good because that's how we learn and you know definitely out of the comfort zone and you know making sure I had everything you know I knew what time the sun was rising setting mm. full moon yeah <laughs> I'd uh, you know spoken to people who had done the race and like tried to watch every YouTube clip until you do it you don't know but that's that gave Rachel all of that preparation stuff gave her a really good grasp of what she was going to encounter from all of that research. Her research is brilliant. So when we had the chat before she left to, to go overseas, for me, she put my mind at ease about how well prepared she was. She'd done the training, but she's also prepared for what the expectations of the day were going to, the two days were going to have. <laughs> and her mindset was, oh, it was like, I'm just moving, I'm moving. I'm not stopping, I'm moving. And I'm saying, you think you can have a lie down? Will you, will you have a little rest? No, I'm just going to keep moving. And that was our that was our mantra was just keep moving. And I think that was the main the main thing that we were grasping on was when everything else is going bad, just keep moving. Yep. And no matter how bad you feel. And that to me gave me huge confidence. And I don't know whether that came back from me to her, but but I absolutely, when she left, I thought, Rachel, there's nothing stopping her. Mm. She would have to actually break a leg and she'd probably keep going. Um, <laughs> but but I was that confident in her preparation. And I'm not talking about training. Training was great. 
She'd done everything she possibly could. There was no question about that. But all the other details she had covered and spent hours of, of preparation, mm. um, understanding the requirements. And, mm. and there's a lot of lessons for a basic Ironman or a marathon that don't have that much information that you have to find out. Go and find out what the course is like. Yep. It, that's pretty much what the temperature is going to be. Is there a wind? Yeah. Are there hills? There's not much more you have to find out. Yeah. But this had everything. This yep. had so much information about nutrition and what's available. And, you know, as she said earlier, getting the nutrition that the race course organisers had, having to apply to get that sent to here and practice with it. So that's how the detail was with Rachel. So so that meeting we had, um, I'm not sure how she left. Oh, I could ask you now, did you leave thinking? Yeah, I just remember you saying to me, keep moving. And that's and I was like, that's all I'm just going to keep telling myself. And I probably told myself that a billion times on the days. Yeah. Just keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Because like I said, I didn't want to let you down. So that that pre-race plan, that pre-race coach athlete talk is so important. And you were kind of saying, how do you possibly prepare? You're saying this from the start of preparation. How do you possibly prepare for a 40-hour 46 hour potentially event you know you how do you come up with a race plan for that like well, apart, apart from just keep moving is that as simple as it was or what else absolutely did you like, that is absolutely yeah. what our final conclusion was we, let's just not worry about the time the cutoff time was the only concern and if we kept moving um we knew that you would be under that and that's why she was adamant she wasn't going to sleep is that a good strategy well probably i think it's a, a better strategy if you stop and then you try to go again that could be fraught with danger um, but other people in the event did that yep and may they may say that was a better strategy but i think for rachel the experience she had as she got tighter hallucinations and stuff like that what's happening to her you would say you probably should have stopped and then got some recovery so that you had a chance to think clearly again but this shows you how mentally tough she is she just charged through that period and, and came out the other end. Uh, and so, look, the plan was never about pacing. It was always about you've got to keep the nutrition up. You've just got to keep moving and you've, you've got to understand how – you've got to ask yourself all the time, how am I going? H- how's my – How's my hunger? How's my energy levels? How's my tiredness? They're the things we talked about and only Rachel could determine. But then there's a point where she can't determine that because she's actually almost losing her. The fatigue from tiredness is if you stay awake all night, you're quite tired the next day at periods during the day. As long as you keep energized with activities, you can get through it. But the minute you stop for a second, you're almost asleep standing up, aren't Mm. you, when you don't sleep all night. So that's a factor that you have to consider uh, as well. Is that what happened? Like in terms of um, the next day, you would, if you found if you stopped, you could have just fallen asleep standing up? <laughs> yes, I was tired, but I was worried if I went to sleep, I wouldn't wake up. Mm. So I thought if I try to go to sleep, I'm not going to go to sleep because I'm going to be worried that I'm not going to wake up. Yeah. So what's the point of even going to sleep? Yeah. But yep. then it was funny when you'd see a bloke sitting on a rock having a sleep. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, do I wake him up? Yeah. <laughs> Is like, he all right? How long yeah, have been? Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, so I, you know, but because it was each man for their own, I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm just preserving myself here. But towards the very last sort of section, unless I was hallucinating, there were three people checking that everyone was okay on that part of the course and I said oh you're here to scan me because they normally scan you as you go through and they said no we're just checking you're okay how are you and I said I'm good I'm really good <laughs> I was like you're not pulling me off no course yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't care how bad fine. I don't care how bad I'm going I just, I just saw Santa Claus back there but I'm actually going well <laughs> and I was like so determined and the last um, aid station they said you're not stopping and I said no, I'm going home to bed. <laughs> and the, there was an English uh, couple that were running and they said, you were so determined at that aid station. You were not stopping for no one. You were just going home. Yeah, yeah. that's unreal. All right, so take us through take us through the experience, getting there and where'd you fly into and then kind yeah. of race week and stuff. Uh, so we flew into Geneva in Switzerland. So it's a, probably about two hours. Not even two hours from Geneva over into France to Chamillon, which is the ski resort, and it's just the most beautiful location in the world. And that's where the race starts, and that's where the race finishes. So we got there just what about a week and a half before. I just had a couple of days in Switzerland, and then we went there. And it's a bit like going to a big event, like a big triathlon, where you know everyone's wearing their triathlon gear, but everyone was wearing their running vests. <laughs> Just walking down the streets. <laughs> and my like we're like, oh, they just been for a run? But everyone, it's like a handbag, was wearing 
their vests. Yeah. And, you know, obviously all the trail shoes and all the trail gear. It was just trail <laughs> city. Trail, <laughs> trail, <laughs> trail city. running <laughs> geek city. Yeah. Like. Yeah. Uh, so that was a real Did opener. Did you join in? Did you no, start no, no. I had my Iron Man <laughs> top on. I was like, definitely stood out. But then after the race, then like the next week before we left, it's all gone. It, so it was just that race week, like all the runners from all the world just take over. Yeah. Um, so that was, yeah, it was just interesting because it was just every nationality and they have a great big expo. Yeah. And I've never seen so much trail running stuff in my life and everything's yeah. obviously lightweight and there's me with, you know, I'm a big heavy torch and a big <laughs> yeah. but because, you know, this was a once in a lifetime, I didn't want to go and spend all the money. Yeah. You know, I spent enough money to get myself there. Yeah. So, yeah, so it was all, it was exciting, but the weather, like one day it was poor with rain, one day it was snowing and then I remember sending your dad a message going, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm really scared. Yeah. It's everything that comes with these big events where you just don't think about it. You don't expect to rock up to a triathlon and just see all the fit people and the fast bikes and because you've been training on yourself with yourself so much. Self-doubt is shocking. <laughs> yeah. It's very overwhelming. Yeah. And, and I think that was the case because I had been by myself. Mm. You're just running by myself and then all of a sudden there's just – and they have multiple events during the week. Mm. So there was a marathon and all the marathon runners came back and they were just covered in mud. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, they only did 40Ks. Look up. <laughs> and I'm looking and they all look knackered. And I'm like, oh, my God, what have I signed up for? What yeah. have I signed up? So this is probably when the, the doubt started to come in. Like the rest of the motivation was there until the few days prior. I'm like, oh, am I doing the right thing? Like <laughs> – you can't underestimate how hard that is to manage. And the weather was pretty bad. The weather days, was very bad. days before bad. the event and it was snowing. Yes, and very cold. But, and when it rained, it absolutely poured. You could... You couldn't keep dry. Uh, so, yeah, that was very – my poor husband, I was a bit stressed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the psychological warfare you're going through in those few, few days prior. And uh, doubting whether you had the right equipment. And yes, I, I went to the expo and kept looking at the 600 euro jacket and going, do I need that jacket? Yeah. Do I need that jacket? Uh, and so buying yeah. the $10 poncho. So, yeah, I bought the $10 poncho <laughs> instead. Uh, yeah, and I didn't need it because we were very, very lucky. You the had the weather, best weather. The weather gods just – and you know, I, I, I think that was um, one of the things. There would have been a lot more people didn't finish if the weather was bad. Yeah, yeah. A, lot more a third people. of the field didn't finish. Imagine if the yeah. weather was bad. But yeah. we looked at the. Uh, oh, they actually do a great uh, job of giving a summary of each individual athlete with uh, checkpoints of video. So the video goes for about five minutes. And, and if you watch this podcast, you'll see some of this footage is absolutely incredible. The, where each time Rachel comes to the next checkpoint, some of the views behind her were out of this world, stunning. It's just I'm not sure whether you saw scenery. much of that because you were. Oh, no, down. no, no, no. I made myself look up and say, look at this, pinch yourself because you are never going to see this again. Yeah, okay. So the night before and the morning of, what were the emotions? Yeah, so it was weird because it was a 6 p.m. race mm. start. Mm. Uh, so Waiting all day. I've never really had an evening race start for anything like that kind of an event. So well, you, your night trail runs for 12 hours at <laughs> 6 p.m. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> true, true. Um, like, what a good decision. That was. <laughs> so, yeah, it was really weird because I was like, okay, just keep off my legs, keep off my legs and just, you know, make sure you're hydrated and, and you know, get some good food into me. So we had a self-contained uh, place where I cooked my own food and you know, made sure I did what you normally do before an event, but just trying to – uh, you know, work out the timing. But you have to get to the start two hours before just to get a good spot on the start line. And it was quite warm then too because it was like four o'clock in the afternoon. And also I had my husband and uh, support crew. There's no cars allowed anywhere, so they've got to go on a bus or a train. So I had to make sure, you know, he, and also I wanted him to get sleep. Um, so he took me to the start in the afternoon and then he caught the train seven k's down the road to see me so that he could go back that night and sleep. So then I knew he was fine. And I met an Australian at the um, Squashy start line. So he was from Adelaide mm-hmm. and um, they're playing – the song they played at the start was Highway to Hell by ACDC. <laughs> um, so there's two Aussies singing Highway to Hell because yeah, yeah. that's about what we're going to do. <laughs> yeah. um, so that was – and you know, it was really nice that you know, I got to ch- uh, 
you know, have an Australian with me. That was mm. like, I think probably the best thing because, you know, each country sticks to them, their own. And it was very squashy because there's like 2,800 of us in this tiny little Shoot. area and all like, you know, it was really squashy and finally race started and I'm like, okay, I just got to do what I do, just going for a run. Um, and it was a lot of argy-bargy um, for quite a while. Um, and I'm glad I've done the New York Marathon and done a few Ironmans where I'm used to argy-bargy, <laughs> but it'd be a bit, um, you know, Confronting. daunting if it was your first big event like mm. that. Um, it wouldn't be, though, because to qualify so hard. So it's, yeah, true, yeah, yeah, true, yeah, true, true, yeah, yeah. true. But norm, trail running is not so argy-bargy over here. Yep. Like, yep. you know, like once you've got your space. So, yeah, so that was uh, – so we had two hours of daylight. So I knew that I wanted to just get that, you know, two hours as far as I could because I knew the first night is going to be, you know, tough because it was the big climbs. So I saw Gordon, my husband, and you know, I never give him high fives, but I gave him a high, high five so he, he could you know, go and relax. And then, then it was just down to business and uh, head torch on and get through that night where it was quite windy up the top of the hills. And I thought, oh, you know, is it going to get cold? But you could feel the temperature change as you went down the hills. Mm. Mm. Uh, so it was, you know, that was, it was, we were lucky. It wasn't wet. It wasn't, it wasn't. Like people were stopping putting jackets on, but I didn't need to. I was okay. And then it was like every checkpoint was different. So it wasn't like uh, water, electrolyte, <laughs> you know, like Iron Man, you know, exactly each checkpoint. So you'd go in and it'd be someone slicing the meat on the meat slicer. Oh, uh, yeah. There's the cheese. Yeah. There's the bread. Yeah, just anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, you know, they um, very environmental friendly. They don't have bottles. Uh, so they have soda stream making the cola yep. uh, and all the Europeans drink mineral water. So, yeah, all these things that we don't normally mm-hmm. would, um, find. Mm-hmm. And then you finally just find the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, and the volunteers, like all events, you know, th- the, if you didn't have them, the Nothing event happened. wouldn't run and there's yeah. so many volunteers and they do want to help you. So I was a lot of sign language, but, you know. I was was like, that a disadvantage, not being able to speak French, Italian and Spanish? No, I don't Swiss think French. so. I don't think so because, you know, aqua is water, you know, <laughs> and you just – I would get them to fill my flask halfway and then pour my electrolyte yeah. and then they'd put the rest and they just want to help you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you just cross your legs, you got to go to the toilet <laughs> <laughs> and they'd laugh and just go like this. Yeah, point over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, I, I pro- like, you're trying not to spend too much time in the checkpoints but because each checkpoint was different and you're trying to find everything and mm. always the toilets were far, far away, I felt like I was t- spending too much time in the mm. checkpoints mm. Um, so I was like okay you've got to keep moving keep moving keep moving yeah. <laughs> um, and they scan you you know obviously your your race number so I knew that people were tracking me yep. so I'm like okay people know where I'm at so Italy uh, Coromaya is where it's um, your 80k mark and you're allowed to have a bag there <laughs> so that was always the halfway point get to that bag and have a good break. And I set myself 20 minutes and I was 23 minutes because there was a big toilet queue line and I was three minutes, I was so angry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. that's three minutes so yeah. I've lost. Yeah. And out of Italy, it was this massive climb and <laughs> most people had their support crew walking with them. Oh, yeah. And that yeah. killed me as well because, like, it was a three-hour wait to get through the tunnel, which is normally 45 minutes. So it would have taken Gordon six hours just to get through the oh, tunnel. And I didn't want him to do that. Yeah. So so I, it was my doing, but I was like, oh, I wish I had somebody. Yeah. <laughs> and then it was like, just remember the nights in the Dandenongs, you had nobody. Yeah, you know, yeah, um, yeah. Um, and then I had Gordon was at the 126K mark in Switzerland. So that was my goal just to get to him. And I'm like, he's been waiting there a very long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. And I felt so bad because I was way off any time I thought I'd be there. So, yeah, he had to hang out at Switzerland for a while. That um, must happen so often um, <laughs> to the checkpoint crew where you don't know what's happened in between the last 40k where you've just run a marathon anything could happen in that period so people could would come in hours later than anticipated right it's quite concerning is yeah. it you the- saw a lot of checkpoint and the, the supporters were just all sleep on the floor yeah. they were just yeah. sleeping everywhere you yeah. know like and i didn't know are they spectators are they runners <laughs> yeah. you know like yeah. it was like a war zone yeah. especially the second day yeah uh, and like like you can see on the video i come into the checkpoint and i'm just like you know like a um headlights you know in my 
eyes because I'm just, just like, okay, find. where is everything? Yeah. And, you know, like, where's the toilet? Where's the water? You know, like it wasn't set that you could go there and there's the water. Yeah. There. And so that was something I wasn't prepared for. And it's it's uh, Jess Learmonth, actually, one of the world's best um, triathletes. She was support crew for her partner and uh-huh. she posted on Instagram saying that that is harder than any triathlon she's ever done, being the support crew. <laughs> <laughs> I know she said the most stressful marks, anxiety producing when he just didn't turn up for three hours at a checkpoint. And, and you can just imagine that's the not worry, even, not even doing the race. And yeah. you don't even think about these little things like the differences at the checkpoints. Like that is just a stress and decision-making process that you don't need to go through when you're 30 hours into a race and not trying anything new on race day. Where, yeah, there's all this food there that you, you don't yeah. get in the dandy nongs in those training sessions. <laughs> do you try them or do you just ignore them? Because that's hard stuff to, to get through. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I was tracking Rachel most of the two days and the periods where she'd stopped and I was thinking, Oh, please, please. She's not injured. She hasn't fallen over. So it's kind of, I've watched a lot of Ironman races, um, but that's only 10 or 14 hours. Um, but uh, as a coach, it was like, oh, far out. This is, you just got no control of what's happening. And then all of a sudden, the beacon moves. The uh, the surprising part was the 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 fact the environment wasn't that, that friendly. You mentioned the argy bargy at the start, but the whole time there was probably a lack of camaraderie, which you weren't expecting. Yes. Yeah, so trail running, I have always found to be a very, friendly event in Australia, someone passes, you say, keep going, good on you, mate, you know, well done. Uh, they, there's always, or passing, not over there. And we all had our flags on our back. So people knew what language people spoke. So the French definitely only spoke to the French, but I was just amazed that, you know, people didn't, didn't speak. But then as the event went on, I knew why people wouldn't speak. They were just saving every energy they had. Mm. Um, I did speak to an English guy the second night. We had a big climb over these tree roots and it was just horrible. And I said to him, this isn't a very friendly event. And he made the same comment. And he said, oh, in England, you know, trail running is really low key. But um, he was saying you know, he didn't think it was friendly. But it might have been our experience. But um, I did get pushed over a couple of times mm. because it, where it's single track and it was like a, a ditch where obviously the when the snow melt or the water goes down and it was very narrow and I kept getting out of the ditch to let people pass and I got to the point where I was like, I can't keep getting out because it was a step up and mm. a step down. I'm using too much energy. Mm-hmm. That's where the extra Ks are, yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I was holding my line. I felt like I was a cyclist, you know, I'm holding my line, I'm holding my line and a French guy pushed me over and it really, like I was just scratched and ça va? <laughs> like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, I saw like, like people always falling over and you just go, ça va? Yeah. You, know? like, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you just didn't care. Yeah. And, and that was really um, a different environment. But, you know, I guess it's just everyone's just trying to preserve their energy. And, and I'm not an elite athlete, you know. I'd hate to be in the elite if they, mm. you know, this was the age groupers at the back, you know. like um. It's, it's <laughs> intriguing, isn't it? And uh, you go into survival mode, don't you? And uh, you just uh, want to spend the least energy you possibly can. And, 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 and that's what you should be doing. As a caring human being, you know that that's not your personality, but it's like the <laughs> white line fever. Um, you cross that line and it's like survival now. For a lot of athletes, it would be a case of every single sentence spoken probably matters. And, I, you know, if you read the UTMB website, I was surprised at this after hearing your experience that the the uh, mantra is surpassing one limit, one's limits, fair play, respect for people and the environment and solidarity. And So I'll tell you a funny story. <laughs> when the Spanish guy, a Spanish guy pushed me over and this, I was just... I'd had enough. <laughs> and I just said, respect. This race is about respect. Yeah. And he's going off at me in Spanish. <laughs> and I, I, I don't know what he said to me. He, he said, might have been I'm saying, sorry, Rachel. Yeah, but, it's like, but you know what they're like when they speak. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, just keep going. You know? yeah. <laughs> but, you know, that's part of it all. And, you know, I, it was a... I don't know, maybe it was my experience, but I found, you know, it was very different to trail running in Australia, that's for sure, where, you know, if you were doing a big climb and you're all walking, everyone's having a chat. Mm. Uh, this was yeah. you having a big climb, everyone was just like... <gasps> <gasps> I love that so much. <laughs> but when you put it in perspective, I mean, the, big, the biggest <laughs> event in, at Kosciuszko, you were 12 hours slower. So, so I think... I don't think anybody really is going to have that same, you know, over a, a 50K trail run, you know, you've got time to be 
partying almost. Um, but yeah, look, I, I'm not defending it <laughs> one bit, but uh, but I can understand um, how uh, when you go into survival mode, you are in survival mode, and I've been there many times myself but not not to the extent that you have but uh but yeah you just got to look after yourself in any way you can and and if it means you know holding your line you're gonna do it aren't you well i was trying yeah (laughs) yeah yeah. so what was the hardest part of the race the downhills Mm -hmm. yeah the downhills were just brutal on your toes we ran down a lot of uh chair lifts like so the top of the chair lift and you go down zigzag zigzag all the way down so um, but we ran down like next to a glacier, which where it was melting, you ran in the, the melting water on the rocks and the rocks were mm. moving. Mm. And I just remember running as hard as I could down that hill because I thought the rocks are moving, just keep moving. And I just was following the people in front of me. If they rock went flying, I went the other rock. <laughs> um, and the tree roots, some of those tree roots, <laughs> I've never seen tree roots like it. And, of course, you know, I'd come so far, I didn't want to fall mm. and you know, hurt that myself. Race, yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the downhills definitely took their toll. Uh, the Europeans walk the uphills, walk the flat and run down the downhills like they're downhill skiing. So that was hard too because they just were going so right, hard. Pasture so hard to pass you and you were just like I've got nothing I was going to say so what point did you feel the tiredness um so the downhills were tough yep but what about what about your tiredness your lack of sleep and yeah that second night because it was uh it was a bit darker we were in a forest and it spread out a bit more and it was very quiet um that's when I sort of thought oh there's a dog up there and it would be a tree you know yeah. <laughs> and then oh they're filming because they did have live film yeah. and I was like okay wipe the stud off my nose you know make sure I'm looking good and ah, oh, it's trees <laughs> <laughs> um and it was just to the point where I was like it felt like it was never gonna end mm. but as soon as the sun comes up you got that different mindset ah oh, you're a whole new person anyone can run in the daylight but I think that <laughs> for that, no, that night, it felt long, but it went like that at the same time. I was yeah. like, oh, I just put my head torch on. I'm taking my head torch off. Mm-hmm. And I think when I knew it was the second day and I knew that I was just had a few more big climbs, it wasn't the climbs, it was the downhill. So at each aid station, they had a sign. So how long it was to the next aid station, what time the cutoff you had to be there by. How much ascent? I didn't look at it. I just looked at the descent <laughs> yeah. and and psyched myself up. Okay, I've got, you know, 2,000. 2,000, that's all right. 2,000 <laughs> metres of descent. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. I can do that. Yeah. Yeah. The mindset of the others would be 2,000 ascent. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Going, oh, am I, gonna climb? I love the uphill. Yeah. I love it. I wish it was all uphill. It would have been so much nicer. <laughs> so what what parts of the race were you – I mean, how was your neg- – how was your uh, – I wouldn't say negative self-talk. Yep. How yep. was your self-talk yep. um, throughout it? Yeah. So the coach had sent me a message and it said, you've got this. So I, I kept telling myself I've got this and keep moving. So – they were anytime I felt like I was thinking this is shit. Mm-hmm. I um, can I swear on here? Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure people will understand it. Yeah. Um, I uh, would say, Yep, you've got this, just keep moving, just keep moving. Um, I was three hours ahead of the check, the cutoff time for the um, cutoff time, like for quite a while then it got down to two and a half hours mm. then I started to get a bit stressed and then I kept saying well you've come this far you know like at least you can say you've come this far mm. you know like, yeah. so I was trying to just say yeah I, you know I've done 140 you know yeah. like and I've I've been to three two <laughs> two countries I've been to the third one or, you know like yeah. um so I think and then I'd stop and go not physically stop but stop my me- my mind and go look around at what the scenery is and quite often you come around a corner and one of the climbs and there'd just be a big flock of sheep just hanging out mm. or you go and there'd be goats and then just cows and they're just all wandering there's no fences anywhere yeah. um so you know you had to just go this is just nature like yeah. look how beautiful it is and the, I remember it was quite warm and people were runners were actually in the water on the the melted glacier you know yeah. lying in the water yeah. um, and I'm like oh I'm not doing that yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think just yeah trying to just bring it back to where you were at mm-hmm. um, I kept I didn't want to look too far forward mm. And I, and I just would go, okay, look how far you've come. Yep, yep. Like, yeah, yeah. Were you talking to yourself a lot? Were you – Yeah. Was yeah. your mind – did you find your mind wandering at no, times? No, I found it was pretty much just keep moving. Mm. Like um, 
I think like I kept, I knew I had to get to Gordon at that one. Mm. So that was a good, good you know, I got to get to, and I'm like, oh, he's been waiting so long. He's been waiting so long. Get to him, get to him. Mm. Um, and it was, it was like a bit like Iron Man where you're just letting the run and you're trying to get to the next aid station, yep. just trying to get mm. to the next aid station. So I guess that's how I can explain it to a lot of people. Did you draw on your training much did you think about the preparation you'd done or yeah yeah I think so like I was like when I was um but I think like I went no training would have been enough training <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. because I've never done anything that long yeah yeah you know, just so you can't adequately prepare there was never it. enough training yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah like and the winner he moved from America to the race yeah. location mm, to train because he wanted to win 20 yeah. odd hours was yeah yeah freak yeah, yeah, they're, they're seriously running it's just it's, uh, it's absolutely insane and then what was happening physically to your body what was what was breaking down yeah and that was that was um interesting because i soon learned that my mind was overriding my body like my mind was like you are going to do this it took um, you to this race to learn that i'm <laughs> quite shocked at that <laughs> yes <laughs> um my f- legs were burning from about uh, 90 k's yeah. like because of that really rough downhill yeah. on those rocks I yeah. think did that damage yeah. um, so very dry because of the breathing so no matter how much you tried to drink you're just dry mm-hmm. just dry like um, so and you'd see like um, troughs for the you know the cattle and you just get your cup and drink out. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I think about it now, I'm like, what was I thinking? But it was just anything like seriously, if someone was out there selling ice cream or icy poles, they would make a fortune. Because fortune. Yeah, yeah. that was the thing they didn't have at the aid stations. Yeah. They had like potato chips and I'm like, I need Salt. something. You know, yeah. like orange. I was eating the oranges because they yeah. were soothing. Mm-hmm. They were nice. Um, so uh, Obviously, my quads were burning, my hamstrings were burning. Everyone goes, what about your knees? I'm like, my knees were probably the one thing I didn't even think of. Mm. Um, But everything started to hurt. Your back's hurting because of the pack. Your arm's hurting from the poles. So everything's hurting. You're like, okay, it's just going to hurt. Just suck it up and keep going. And you mentioned uh, something that uh, you didn't think about or no one would think about, but you said you, you'd never worn shoes for 41 hours straight and that's an interesting experience. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've never had blisters. I'm um, always, for long events, I Vaseline my feet. Even when I get off the bike for an Ironman, I Vaseline my feet, put my socks on and run the marathon. I've never had blisters. And at the 80K mark, I stopped, I cha- like changed my socks and all socks I'd run in before, the same trail mm. shoes I'd run in, you know, everything was the same. I put nearly the whole jar of Vaseline <laughs> on each foot at the 80K mark, but I had blisters like it, never before, but everyone had blisters. Mm. Um, so I knew that Gordon had a bag. I put a bag of everything I possibly needed. It must have weighed 20 kilos that he had to carry um, at the at that checkpoint because I didn't want to go to medical. Uh, medical make you lie down, fill out all the paperwork. <laughs> That's 20 minutes. I just want some Band-Aids. Yeah. I wasn't doing that. Yeah. So when I saw Gordon, the, I Band-Aid and the most dodgy Band-Aids I could, you know, and Vaseline my feet. And I just remember Gordon saying to me, I think you need a T-shirt. So I obviously stunk to high heaven. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the blisters, uh, you know, I'm not going to let a blister stop me. Yeah. Like, but, yeah, who wears shoes for 40-odd hours? Yeah, yeah. You know, you go to sleep. Like, yeah. And uh, my trail shoes were the most comfortable shoes. I'm never wearing them again. <laughs> <laughs> would you, if you were to do it again, would you consider uh, swapping shoes halfway through? Having I did have another, I did have shoes for that, mm-hmm. but at that point I I was fine. Yep. So I don't know. Like I thought I had really good socks and, you know, like, but then I spoke to like a few Australians and everyone was the same. Yep. Yep. Everyone had blisters. So, um, yeah, I'm just not sure that someone said they reckon it's because there's a lot of grit yep. gets in your shoes. So I see maybe I should have had, ga- ga- what are yeah. those gator things? Yeah. But not the Europeans yep. didn't really have yeah. them either. So, yeah, that was something that I was surprised, but it was good because you learn. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my Vaseline didn't do the job. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And so what surprised you about about the event that you weren't expecting? Because you were so well prepared. So Yeah, I don't think I thought that my toes were going to be – I've never had my toes hurt so much. I felt like as a ballet dancer on point sh- – mm. on ballet points you know because you're just on your toes going up the hills yeah. trying to grip on but yep. going down um so yeah I, I i didn't think that the downhill so if anyone was to do this event i would just say 
practice going down hills like you've never done ever before. If you were to pick the toughest period, was it the 25 to 30 hour mark? Was it the that point to the last last checkpoint? Was it the last downhill? Uh, the last downhill was pretty horrible. That wasn't pretty because um, I was just hurting so much. So yeah, that was, I was pretty, pretty much over it by then. But I just was like, I've come so far, I've just got to get this finished. So yeah, pretty much that last downhill. Like, um, the last checkpoint my husband was at, uh, was that he could come to. And he said to me, you've got one big climb. It's taking people four hours to do it. Mm. So I'm like, four hours. Mm, great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just going out there for another four plus hours because yeah, yeah. I knew I was going to be slower because yeah. by this time, you're just getting slower and slower because you're fatigued. And no matter what food, you just can't eat anything, you mm. know. Like I was like, I didn't even look at the aid stations because they were all the same. Mm. I'm like, okay, let's get another jelly. And, oh yeah. yeah, this just tastes great. Yeah. <laughs> so were you, were, did you find that you couldn't consume any more fuel, you, or did you have adequate? Did you think you were adequately fueled, or t- take I us was, through that? Yeah, so I had a lot of um, gels and the the knack bars. Um, they had chocolate chip. You, know, you probably don't want to hear this, but they had chocolate chip cookies. That they were the best chocolate chip cookies to a point where I was like, I can't do the chocolate chip yeah, cookies yeah, anymore. Yeah. Um, they had little Snicker bars, and I put them in my pocket. By the time I got up the first climb, they'd melted. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm not eating those because I thought oh, I'll take them for when I get to the top yeah, but, you yeah. know, so. and then at the top of a lot of the climbs there was nothing so that's why you had to drink out of the trough yep. um, <laughs> um, so like I I drank a lot because I had to go to the toilet a lot so I mm-hmm. knew I was hydrated, hydrated a lot but mm-hmm. I was still dry mm-hmm. um, but yeah your stomach goes I don't need anything yep. you know like I, I, I remember looking at one of the aid stations and I went there is nothing here that I want to eat. But you didn't feel like you were going hunger flat. So, no, yep. no, because I think we're not. Go- it's, you're not going that ex- that, that, that extreme. Yeah, yep. that intensity. Yep. So, um, but you're fatigued. So everything shuts down. They're like you like you. It's like you're in your own war zone just to survive. Mm. So your body just is just shutting down. You no stomach. I was saying, you know, I could smell everything, and then you can't smell anything anymore. You know, it's like your your body's just going. No, we're just getting you to the keep moving. You know, to the. What was it like knowing that you had maybe another hour to go, um, and half an hour or an hour and a half? Were, were you conscious of I'm I'm nearly there. Well, I'd asked the English guy about the last downhill because he had done it and he said to me, oh, it's a bit brutal, right? So I sort of had that in my head, but it was more than just a bit brutal. Yeah. Um, so um, we got to the top of the, the highest point and the photographer had said, uh, you're at the highest point and he's taken a photo and I've got this great smile and then he says, now you've got to go downhill and my smile goes. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and he's taken the, the two photos and only him and I would know that that's, you know, yes, I'm happy, no, I'm not. <laughs> Um, he said, you've got to go down and then you're, then you're home. So I was like, okay, I can do this. You know, I can do this. I can get, and I didn't stop at the checkpoint. I just kept going down. But, um, and someone, a girl said, oh, you've got about an hour. I'm like an hour. It's five K's. I've got an hour. (laughs) (laughs) And then the time starts ticking in my head. I'm like, what time is it? Like how long have I been out here? And on your front of your bib, uh, there was an Australian flag. And as I'm going down the hill and I'm trying to jog the best I could Mm. down the hill, these people said, Aussie, Aussie. And I'm like, finally English. What time is it? (laughs) (laughs) And they said, it's 11.30. And I'm like, okay, I've got 4.30 to finish the race. Mm. The lady said an hour. I'm probably going to be an hour and a half. Like it probably took me about 20 minutes to work this out in my head. <laughs> yeah. So it was good because it kept me yeah. focused. I'm focused. I'm like, okay. And then I got to the bottom of the hill. We had to cross the road. But they did a mateship like at the Grand Prix oh, yes. where you've got to go Walk the medal yep. up the stairs across and down. Oh. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> and I'm looking at the road and I'm like, I'm just going to run across the road. And the traffic's like this, you know, <laughs> like because it's the only road in and out. And I'm like looking at the volunteer and I'm like, I can't be disqualified now. I've come this far. Get your ass up the stairs. So I hop the wonky stairs, you know, and you're already wonky yourself. Yeah, yeah. And then going down, I'm just grunting. <laughs> And then it was flat and I just ran. I was like, I'm, I'm home. Yeah. And the volunteer, as you come in, goes, welcome back. Oh. And that was the best thing anyone said to me. 
and around the corner was my husband. He wore this bright lobster shirt, so he stood out and I saw him and he had when he saw me, he just had the biggest smile and that was the, probably one of the highlights to see his mm. smile. And I'm like, I'm yelling, I did it, I did it. <laughs> and, oh. and everyone around me started cheering because yeah. I could hear how yeah. excited I was. And the one nice thing about this event is they let the vol- your family come with you. Mm-hmm. Yep. So he ran down with me and he's asking how I am and, and I'm just like, I've done it, I've done it, I've done yeah. it. And, um, yeah, we finished and you don't even get a medal. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the last 100 metres, is that the best euphoric oh. experience I think Kona has a better yep. finish, yep. but like, um, because this event's going for days, so there is a lot of people. There was, yeah, there I was, was, there was there a lot of people waiting for you to come. There was a lot of people, um, and I went slow down the finish because there was French finishers in front of me, three of them, and they hogged the whole thing, and because they're French and it's you know French majority, <laughs> so I was going slow, but I nearly fell over because when you hit the carpet, it wasn't even, and I nearly fell over on the carpet, and I'm like, don't fall over now, you've come yeah. this far. Yeah. Um, I think I was just so happy that I did it, mm. and I was, and I, I was worried about the cutoff. And my husband's like, "You killed the cutoff, yeah, you know, like because yeah. he he knows me. He's just like, you did it well in the yeah, cutoff." Yeah. Um. So yeah, it was pretty special. And but there's like you just finish, and that's pretty much it. You go and collect your bag, and you go and collect your vest, and um, yeah, a little bit different to Ironman finishes. Yep. So no finishing recognition. No, like um, – So they're relying on the fact that you know you've done it yourself. Yeah, but they had a, s- a screen and you went over to the screen and your race number set that your time. So it says um, said my name and that you know what time and um, what position I came. So that was your certificate, so to speak, on the screen. So position. You've ended up coming fourth overall in your age group. Yeah, I think there's about 25 girls though. It's not a lot of girls. <laughs> but at one point you were in third. Yes. Tell us tell us, <laughs> tell us, us how that was playing out as so, part of your thought process. Obviously the whole goal of this event was to finish. I never cared where I placed. Yep. Um, you know, I just wanted to finish within the cutoff. That was always the goal. Um, but my husband knows that I'm very competitive. Um, so I had no idea where you are. Like you have no idea. There was only 11% female in the whole field. So I didn't feel like I saw a lot of females anyway because it spread out um the last checkpoint where I saw my husband he said uh if you you'll catch the Malaysian girl on the hill you'll be third and I looked at him like you know he's lying to me but anyway (laughs) because you know I was so fatigued um at that point you know you just survival mode I'm like okay but I caught the Malaysian girl going up the hill and I actually said to her good on you you know I did the sportsman (laughs) thing (laughs) and she didn't like that I don't think (laughs) But she got me on the other side going down the hill and she kept looking over her shoulder running down that hill like she was running for third. Um, but, you know, I had nothing left on the downhill. I, I was like, it's all yours. I just – and that's when I knew that I was pretty much d- fatigued and done because normally I wouldn't let anyone beat mm. me. But there was – this body was like, you're just finishing. It doesn't matter where you finish. Um, there was only 188 girls out of the um, 1,000, I think, 700 finishers. Um, and 951 people didn't finish. So over 30% didn't finish. Oh, I'm just proud I finished. Mm-hmm. You no, know, I did it. It's <laughs> an incredible stat. Do you get that post-race afterglow or are you so exhausted that, I mean, what's the next one to two hours like? Uh, I went to the ice cream shop before I did anything <laughs> and it was the best ice cream in the whole world yeah. and I got three scoops and I'd never, ever get three scoops. I can't even tell you what flavour I got, <laughs> but it was just so just so- to just soothing yeah. and I just sat on the floor like it's basically like in the ice cream. It, it was, yeah, yeah. I was just so dry. Mm. Um, then you try and have a shower and I've, I then I went to sleep for a couple of hours. Did and you eat? Did you eat anything? No, no, just no. the ice cream. Yep. Just the ice cream, and I didn't want to ever drink again because you know, I felt <laughs> like I drank so much. So, yep. um, on your race kit, they give you, um, as I said, your flag on the back, and on the other side, it said, "I'm sleeping." So, if you did stop and sleep, you're Flip meant to put that on yep. so people knew that you were okay and you were sleeping. Yep. So, my husband actually put that on me and sent that through to my family. Uh, you know that I was just sleeping, yep, yep. Um, and then the pain started. Mm. Then there was no more sleeping it was like you are on fire like and I think like I was I couldn't that whole night you just couldn't sleep because you and your body's so out of whack it doesn't know mm. what's happening what is the pain is it is it um you just describe what's happening like yeah what? it was just I think the all the lactic built up yeah, it just yeah. burning everything was burning but my 
feet, my toes, just sore. The whole everything was sore. Everything was sore. Um, but then you, you know, you start hearing about people that didn't finish. I was in the laundromat the next day washing all my clothes and uh, Can you I, walk the next day? Yeah. Yeah. I, I like as we all know, keep moving. Mm. Um so yeah, I was just stairs were really bad. Mm-hmm. Um, downhill stairs. I didn't avoided any kind mm-hmm. of downhill. Mm-hmm. Was it a problem the laundromat being fifteen k away from you to walk? <laughs> uh, it wasn't too bad. It was probably about. It was probably in about a five minute walk, but it probably took me twenty minutes. <laughs> yeah. Like I had to allow a bit of time. But we booked into the day spa, and that was like I said to Gordon, we better allow an hour to walk the twenty minutes. Mm. But um, once I went to the spa, and we, uh, you know, got yep. everything sort of a bit of. Um, um, flow. Flow, yeah, that really helped. But, I've yeah, definitely just found them keep moving, keep moving. But obviously blisters and all the toenails are falling off mm. and black. And, mm. um, yeah, my feet were pretty – my ankles were really swollen. Yeah. Um, that took a few days for them to go down. And what is your what is your post-race reflection? Um, and I'm talking in terms of, yeah, that, that first few days and then yeah, yeah, now yeah. – how long has it been? It's been – uh, so Friday will be three weeks. So three weeks. yeah, so yeah. it's still still very fresh. Yeah. Um. You know, obviously, my first reaction was I am never <laughs> ever <laughs> doing this again. Yeah. And my husband goes, "Yeah, right." <laughs> yeah. And then I was like, "I am never doing a hundred miles again. It's yeah. too hard on your body." Yeah. And then you know you have a few weeks and you're like, yeah. "Oh, maybe." Yeah. <laughs> Can yeah. I do forty hours or thirty nine? Yeah. <laughs> But I did meet an Australian and he had done done the event the year before in 36 um, hours and I said, oh, what are you hoping for? And he wanted to improve by 30. He only improved by one hour. Mm. You know, wow. So, um, And I wow. said to him, you didn't tell me it was that brutal. And he goes, I don't remember it being that brutal. <laughs> so, you know, so I'm like, yeah, remember that conversation yeah. Yeah, yeah. if you ever do it again. But yeah. um, I think the response I've had from people that, especially people that don't exercise, they're just blown away. So I realised that, you know, I've done something that most people probably wouldn't have a go at. Um, or couldn't do. Yeah. So I think that's that's why I thought I'd do the podcast because you've asked me so many times to do a podcast. I'm like, no, 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 no. Yep. And I'm like, look, if I can inspire one person out there, don't, don't give up. You know, I'm, I'm not an elite athlete. I'm just out there having a go and getting all my dreams ticked. You know, no, it's, so. it's an unbelievable story. And, uh, you know, just to go and do a 5K uh, park run, yeah. For some people, is is a Mont Blanc challenge mm-hmm. for yeah. them um, in perspective. So, so that's you know we want people to be healthy and fit and have a longer enjoyable life. And you know if you're at a desk all day, it's really difficult to do that to be concentrating on your health and fitness because you're not moving. And you know you've you've really mastered that art of you know commuting to work, doing your your, your, your office job and then commuting home and then training on the weekends. It, you're a real leader of uh, how it can be done and she's there's some sacrifices you have to make which you're quite good at doing. Um, and and for those listening out there, we're not expecting you to do a Mont Blanc, but just to get yourself moving and uh, they're the things that are going to help help you when you get to the ripe old age of 70 or 80, that you'll have a better 70 or 80 uh, period in your life where you can actually function rather than being, you know, almost uh, unable to, to do anything without care. And uh, I think these are the things that we're trying to get across to people in our podcast of how important uh, exercise is to the longevity of your um, – but doing things like a, a Mont Blanc is probably detrimental in some ways <laughs> to, to, to uh, the functionality of how human – body should uh to should be able to to perform but it, uh, look we're so grateful that you've come on and because you are very quiet and humble human being and uh it takes a lot for you to talk about yourself so uh, we're really grateful for uh for you uh, spilling the beans on what what actually happened and and uh, hopefully it inspires others to get off their chair and uh and and uh get themselves fit and healthy and uh, enjoy enjoy some of the experiences that you've had which have been an unbelievable story so far and i'm sure there's many to come and we've just been talking about what you're going to do next so you haven't really spilled the beans on me what you're going to do next so oh, any no. ideas no i've got a few things but it won't be uh, yeah uh, just letting the body recover at the moment so yeah. and that's such an important lesson for anyone doing any endurance event marathon half ironman ironman even half marathon the recovery period you still obviously haven't ran um, oh. yeah, you, you'll, you'll be a while <laughs> off that i imagine <laughs> yeah i just um I, I have like you just said there's a lot involved getting to the event mm-hmm. uh 
So a lot of things get put to the side. So now it's time to look after those things a little bit, like, you know, clean my house. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But, you know, I, um, yeah, just keep moving and, uh, yeah, there'll be goals that'll come along. But, you know, obviously that was a big one that I ticked off and, yeah, we'll uh, see what what the body wants to do next. And there was just, yeah, we were firing questions at you then, but there's just a great description of how the race unfolded. And I haven't asked you, Dad, what was your experience um, seeing her finish and knowing the preparation that went into it and just watching how it all unfolded and, and, you know, she got there. Yeah, nothing but admiration. And unfortunately, I sat there on Sunday night or whatever night it was watching the video live stream, which was absolutely brilliant, and watching all these people come in and, and I'm... Th- I'm sure she had four minutes to go when I had, I even had Aunt Andy, my wife, joining in to watch the finish and Rachel didn't appear. And then it appeared like she'd finished. And so I must have been watching something that was delayed because I wasn't actually watching the finish and I had to wait till, till I saw the video somewhere else before I could actually see her come through the finish line. So I, I didn't get that feeling, which is really disappointing because that's been one of the things I love when I'm watching Iron Man to see people actually cross the line. Yeah. But when I did get to see her um, finish, um, even though it was a delayed video, oh, it was almost te- oh, I almost started crying. It was it was one of those experiences that you just go, yeah. how did she do that? That yeah. is that is superhuman. Mm. Um, and and look, I've just got utmost respect for the way you go about it and, and everything everything that you achieved is well deserved because you prepared incredibly well and and you get what you deserve a lot of the time and sometimes you don't, but you definitely got what you deserved and that was, you know, an, an incredible feat and uh, and I was super proud of, um, of of you just as a person and as a human being and, and you're always so grateful for – for everything that happens around you and um, and I love it when this happens to someone who deserves it because you're always caring about other people and for you know for once it's about you and 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 it should be because this is this is an enormous achievement and and for those who do exercise I know one of the other guys that I actually know Kane did did the event who you who met and he was uh, he was actually traveling a same, similar pace as you you're about six hours apart <laughs> um, and you stayed that way for about the last 40k. Um, um, Kane is also an ex-professional athlete, isn't that's he? That's right. <laughs> and so uh, I couldn't wait to tell you that you know, you're doing pretty well here, Rachel. You're not far off Kane, who's, who's a bit of a gun. Um, so, um, so yeah, it was my feelings were just incredibly proud and I um, love to be associated with whatever you're doing and, um, and you certainly challenge me as a coach and, um, and I'm better for it. Uh, because I've learned so much about endurance. Um, you know, these are the reasons why I love doing the job that I do because I'm learning. As with each athlete I coach, I learn so much more about human behaviour and what works and what doesn't work. And uh, it's extending my capabilities as a coach to have someone do an event like this because I've never had anybody go this far before. So now I've got that experience and I'm better off as a, as a result of it. So thank you. Thank you. But also you don't know what you're capable of until you have a go and mm. that's what I've definitely learned from this event. Yeah and that's kind of the last thing I wanted to ask you um, before we finish is you mentioned the reaction to um, the reaction to the race has been pretty interesting and especially because you kept a lot of the preparation hidden um, and so yeah what has that been, that been like for you and that was part of the reason like you said you agreed to come to the podcast because um, you found that yeah the story had inspired some people. And yeah so um, obviously at work people know I do a bit of running and I knew I was going to Europe but I didn't really say what I was doing. Um, I didn't tell pretty much only not even my friends you know like I said I'd go to the parties and just say I have to go and you know go and do my 12-hour training session um because I was really worried that um I didn't want to you know if I didn't finish I didn't want to be an embarrassment um and I was thought that cutoff time was always a worry so I just kept it you know I said to my husband we're not telling anyone we're not putting anything on Facebook or anything until we've done um so he was you know supportive with that he knew so only a core group of people um knew and obviously they're the people that are really important that you know knew what I was doing were really um interested um but then when I you know obviously I've done the event so now I can let people know what I've done and I show people some photos and they're just yeah they're just amazed that a human can go for that long because you know most people's 
you know, like I went back to work and I said to a girl, oh, how are you doing? She goes, I'm so tired. <laughs> I have to be in the office two days this week. <laughs> and I'm in my head, I'm going, you have no idea how tired. <laughs> what tiredness is. Yeah, I'm like, you're not falling over in the dirt because you're tired. <laughs> you're not like trying to tackle a metal staircase over a road <laughs> and wondering how you're going to get up and over it because yeah. you're so tired. Yeah. But, you know, you realise, you know, that you've done something that's so out of your comfort zone. And that's it. Truly, is where the magic happens. Mm. You know, you hear that saying, but you know, I really have experienced it. Mm. Definitely amazing. That's a great way to finish off, and I'm sure you would uh, be rewarding your husband for the the crew job he did. For <laughs> yeah, I couldn't have done it without him. He's you know, a like, yeah, yeah, like that's yeah, you know, definitely. Like as I said, we didn't have many people that knew, but he cooked all the food for me when I come home from work. He'd always say, "How long are you running for?" Like he he is the best support crew, and I think you know that yeah, couldn't have done it without him for sure. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> a good point, isn't it? You just need people supporting you. Um, otherwise, it is a very lonely experience, and and having to share it with someone is even better, isn't it? And like I husband? said, the best thing when people say the best thing was when I saw God and smile when mm. I fin- when I got to him because yeah, you know, he's probably was so relieved because mm. there were times on that tracker I think I was moving you know three kilometers an hour you know mm. <laughs> like, mm. <laughs> but he was there so he knew what co- the mm. the terrain was like so yep. you know my, my dad's like why were you going so slow sometimes <laughs> 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 and then I showed my dad the photo in the footage and then yeah. he's like okay now I get it <laughs> yeah, exactly incredible any final words from you or? no no just uh, loved I've just loved the podcast and uh, it's one of the one of the better ones and uh, the it's you know thank goodness the result was what you wanted because um, I couldn't have stood another year where you're going to go back and, and prove that you could do it because now you've proved that you can do it so um, no well done thank you thank you for all your help incredible story thanks again for coming on the podcast and sharing that that was awesome and we hope everyone uh, listening uh, enjoyed it and we encourage you to jump on and watch the episode because we'll be chucking a lot of clips in from the, the video you gave and it's it's really awesome to see and it gives you a good kind of visual experience of what's happening and Rachel you were somehow smiling at every checkpoint <laughs> <laughs> and big double thumbs up so try to yeah. just to let my family know it was you know, yeah. that I, that I, yeah, yep. the people knew that I was okay. Yep. I think that was why I'm, I made an effort to do that. So people that were, and it's amazing, like people that I didn't think, like you know, would be watching, were watching. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Nah, unreal. That's it for this episode. Again, thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did, and we'll see you on the next one.